loving what you're hearing? Well, the establishment hates it. And right now, they're conjuring up new ways to try and censor RCR. To ensure you never miss a beat of the hard-hitting news you've come to know and love, make sure you're on the RCR mailing list. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. She's back. Olivia Pearson is back on the crunch for her latest edition of Olivia's Views. She's with me now. Welcome back to the crunch, Olivia. Great to have you and share your view, which is what you're going to do right now. Well, thanks, Cam. Good to be here. My view this week is titled Politics is All Caligula's Horse Now. Oh, that sounds very riveting and interesting. Well, when Joe Biden ran for the office of president back in 2020 with obvious dementia in play, we in New Zealand were currently under the joyless years of the equine Jacinda Ardern's regime. Everything had been turned on its head right down to our Bill of Rights to say nothing of healthy people enduring home detentions our governments called lockdowns to keep us safe or safe in Cindy speak. I remember saying to my husband, that all politics now was running at Caligula's horse levels of absurdity. If anyone needs reminding of the ancient Roman story, where Emperor Caligula, who was one very depraved sicko, in order to mock and perhaps even scare the Roman Senate, he threatened to make his favourite horse in Catatus a consul, believing he would be an improvement on senatorial wisdom. I don't believe that this ever transpired, not because Caligula wasn't twisted enough to actually do it, he was, but because he himself was swiftly murdered by his own Praetorians. Rome had had enough of his imperial autocratic insanity, and there were even those who wanted to return the empire back to being a republic again. Alas, things only got worse from there. Within several generations of Caesars, who were arguably much worse than Caligula. His nephew was the sadistic and cruel Nero. The Senate was eventually stripped of all power, becoming nothing more than a ceremonial role. Rome never again became a republic. The republic once lost was lost forever. In Joe Biden's strange address to the American people last week, informing them he was staying on as president, He quoted in his bumbling fashion the anecdote about Benjamin Franklin exiting the four-month meeting of the Constitutional Congress in 1787. A woman asked him, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? Franklin famously replied, a republic, if you can keep it. Now, the audacity of Biden quoting that story at this particular moment in history is just so off the charts, given how much he has actually done to help bring the American Republic to an end. Starting with the stolen election of 2020 and the persecution of all those who seriously leveled that charge, to the 15 to 20 million illegal aliens allowed in over the southern border, who will all be voting in this year's election, even though they are not legal citizens. Then there's the total persecution of his political rival, Donald Trump. Biden has allowed his Department of Justice to commit unprecedented levels of lawfare to bankrupt Trump or lock him away for a thousand years. And only two weeks ago, there was a horrifying attempt to assassinate Trump in broad daylight, which was obviously a political hit involving the Secret Service and FBI of Biden's administration. Of course, the term Biden's administration is always said by me tongue in cheek, since his dementia has precluded any thoughtful governing, which means he has been somebody's puppet all along, as Kamala Cackle's hyena Harris would also be should she succeed. They are both as incapable of governing America as Incitatus the horse would have been of acting like a competent consul in Rome's ancient senate. The only thing I would say on that note is that Incitatus would have been much, much better because he at least would have done absolutely nothing. Whereas Biden and Harris have actually done things, very destructive things. Veteran investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch, the same Hirsch who broke the story during the Vietnam War about the atrocity of the My Lai massacre, 
and the government cover-up of it. Hirsch came out with an article last week titled Leaving Las Vegas, Inside the Last Tortured Days of the Biden Campaign. Relying on only one insider source, a White House senior official who didn't want to be named for obvious reasons, Hirsch claims that Barack Obama, with the blessing of Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer and Raheem Jeffries, phoned Biden and threatened him with the 25th Amendment if he didn't withdraw from the presidential campaign. Obama told Biden, allegedly, that he also had permission from Kamala Harris as the VP, since she is the official who would have to invoke the 25th Amendment and then assume all presidential duties. If this report is true, and I have to say it does have the ring of truth, that is called a coup. And if Biden is not fit enough that they have to take him out of running as the incumbent in this year's election, he can hardly be fit enough to continue being the president with all the duties that role includes, such as commander-in-chief of the entire American armed forces. Obama is not even officially in government anymore, and neither is Nancy Pelosi. These meddlers ceaselessly buzz around like vultures circling a dying animal. And that's exactly what Biden is, a dying puppet president. According to Hirsch, Obama told Biden in that phone call that he was withholding his endorsement of Kamala for a spell, presumably as a tactic to look innocent by way of any meddling on his part. As soon as Biden made that forced and overdue TV appearance to say he was withdrawing from the presidential race this year, but staying on as the president, the Obamas staged this phony phone call to Keckles, which of course was filmed and recorded before being swiftly transmitted to X and beyond. Kamala! Hello. Hi! Hey there! Oh, hi, you're both together. Oh, it's good to hear you both. I, I, I can't have this phone call without saying to my girl Kamala, I am proud of you. This is going to be historic. We called to say Michelle and I couldn't be prouder to endorse you and to do everything we can to get you through this election and, and into the Oval Office. Oh my goodness. Michelle, Barack, this means so much to me. I am looking forward to doing this with the two of you, Doug and I both, and um, getting out there, being on the road. But most of all, I just want to tell you the, the words you have spoken and the friendship that you have given over all these years mean more than I can express. So thank you both means so much. And, um, and we're going to have some fun with this too, aren't we? And we're going to have some fun with this too, aren't we? Thank goodness the clip ends before she burst into her grating laugh. For Kamala, running for President of the United States is emotionally similar to a fun day at kindergarten playing doctors and nurses, which I bet she excelled at in ways we wouldn't want to imagine. Caligula's horse level absurdity. All games, tricks, and fun. She has now been endorsed by all the people who matter in this sick pantomime. The Clintons, who hate the Obamas, the Obamas who hate the Bidens, and the Bidens who now hate everybody. The Democrat Party is the party of hate, corruption, puppets, and phonies. They do not have an authentic bone left in their body politic. But there is an antidote to all this absurdity lying in the powerful opposition. You know, the same opposition that's so powerful that only two weeks ago they tried to murder it in Pennsylvania. It's Trump with his mega Republicans behind him. This time four years ago in 2020, the Republicans, especially the never Trumpers, were trying to resist the sheer force of the mega pressure which resulted in a stolen election where many Republicans were just as complicit as Democrats. They were too weak and still pleading for civility in all discourse and debates, etc. But this year's RNC showed us that the Republican Party is fully MAGA now. I've noticed that instead of pleading for civility, Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene are now telling woke BBC reporters to F off instead of trying to be polite in the face of their obvious activist journalism tactics designed to just play gotcha. 
And in the House Oversight Committee hearing to get to the bottom of obvious Secret Service failures, gentlewomen Republicans, who have always observed the polite formalities of civic mindedness, are now repairing to expressions such as, you really are full of shit, as Nancy Mace said to the director of the Secret Service, Kimberly Cheetle, last week before forcing her resignation. These expressions of contempt are important if you morally value your Republican forms. There comes a time when the evil is just so in your face and constantly pandered to that you just have to draw a line which says no further and forget civility as an automatic response to sheer evil. I'm really glad Republicans are finally here. They should have been 100% aboard in 2016 and 2020 instead of having arguments and silly scruples about Trump's tone and mean tweets. The party of Caligula's horse absurdity is now having a crack at J.D. Vance over his childless cat lady comments, which he said to Tucker Carlson in an interview on Fox three years ago. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made. And so they want to make the rest of the country miserable, too. And it's just a basic fact. You look at Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, AOC, the entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. The Mockingbird media has gone nuts over this old comment in an attempt to paint J.D. Vance as weird. Vance is absolutely correct when he points out how anti-family the Democrat Party have become over the years. One of their major platform issues to win votes is easy abortion policy. I have seen Democrat women protesting hysterically against the Dobbs decision of 2022 that the Supreme Court ruled on to return abortion legislation back to the individual states. Some of these women were quite clearly nuts. One of them even had her swollen pregnant belly exposed with writing on it stating, this will be my sixth abortion. Imagine being proud of that and declaring it publicly. Caligula level insanity right there. Recently, Trump urged Christians in his address at Turning Point Action's Believers Summit to turn out for him ahead of election day, calling it the most important election ever. He added that if elected, Christian-related concerns will be fixed, so much so that they would no longer need to be politically engaged. Christians, get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? It'll be fixed, it'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm a Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. Democrats then use the Mockingbird media to say that this was Trump declaring himself as the dictator he's going to be if elected again. He's going to fix the system so people can't vote anymore, they mendaciously asserted. What nonsense. He also promised to create a federal task force without anti-Christian bias, as well as to defund schools pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content onto the lives of children. Amen to that. The innocence of children needs to be protected in schools again. Personally, I still have my doubts that the presidential candidate for Democrats will actually be Kamala Harris. But we won't actually know until they hold their convention in Chicago come mid-August. That's when we'll see the full ticket emerge. But one thing is for certain. We are in very strange times where so many absurdities have now become normal and no Democrat candidate, especially a Caligula's horse, will be able to win against Trump and his MAGA movement without a massive attempt at cheating and another election steal. Democrats have shown us that they will do absolutely anything, no matter how low and vile, to hold on to their power. And look at what just took place in Venezuela. 
And that is Olivia's view for the crunch this week. Fabulous, Olivia. Absolutely riveting. <laughs> but I've got a question for you. Despite all of that, we've got a lot of our listeners who are saying, hey, how come Cam and Olivia aren't talking about Robert Kennedy Jr.? Oh, well, what should we be saying about him? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> there's you know, all sorts of feedback. They're saying, you know, this is the real deal. He's the man to save America. He's this, he's that, he's everything else apart from the saviour. And I'm sitting there shaking my head and I'm thinking, how can I explain this in easy to understand terms without actually getting into a civics lecture about how the American political system works? Well, he's an independent. That's isn't he? Right. And history shows us in the 200 and something years of the Republic that only one independent has ever been elected. And ironically, it was the first. President George Washington, <laughs> who was unanimously elected by the whole of Congress to be the president. Yeah, due to um, services to the revolution. That's right. So there have been notable exceptions, people who were independent candidates but didn't win, who then subsequently joined a party like the Democrats or the Republicans and then went on to win the presidency. But after George Washington, and what are we up to? We're up to President number 47 at the next election. There's been 46, 45 subsequent um, presidents. Not one has been elected as an independent. No. So history against them. And if it couldn't happen for Teddy Roosevelt with the Bull Moose Party, it won't happen for Kennedy. No. Nowhere near it. No, I mean, independent. That, yeah, the Americans don't like independence and they're never going to win. They have to join one of the major parties. I think some of our people, Cam, would like to have seen Trump um, name Kennedy as his VP. They wanted to see that, didn't they? Forget, though, that Kennedy's not independent. He's actually a Democrat. Yeah, he's always been a Democrat. Right. Yeah. Now, Kennedy clan are Democrats they're through and through. Kennedy's standing independently because he can't stomach the Democratic Party right now, but he's by no means a Republican. And if you go back through his long history, there's a few things there that raise a few questions for political tragics like myself. <clears throat> mm, um, well, he was a massive greenie for a long time, very much behind the climate change stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's that. Uh, it, but a lot of people have only really seen Robert F. Kennedy Jr., um, in in the last three or four years when he's been, yeah, yes, he's got street cred when it comes to the COVID nonsense and mm, all the questions. Yeah, he does. But that's like that's like three years out of a, a 30-year history. Mm. So. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't be a great fan. I do, I really respect the work he's done on all the anti-vax stuff. I think he's done the Lord's work there for sure, so to speak. Um but he is a Democrat. He would be enormously liberal over issues that you want conservative um, ideas on. And I personally, I think Trump chose the right man. And J.D. Vance, I like him. I, I just laughed like hell when the Democrats got upset about the crazy cat lady um, comment. You know, the thing with J.D. Vance is he's a lot like Trump. Is he, he, he thinks what he knows what he thinks and then he says what he thinks. And you, you're not going to die wondering what he, what he's actually thinking about something, but he's well, actually that, done the hard yards, you know, as a as a kid, uh, and you know, starting out in his career, served as a marine. You know, he's got some huge credentials there. Oh, he he does. Um, and remember, he was one of the never Trumpers until he saw Trump govern, and he changed his mind. He thought he was an excellent president. I really like J.D. Vance. I think that um, I, what I love, you, you just mentioned it, between he and Trump, they're both so authentic. And, and it's that authenticity that you just do not ever see on the Democrat side. They are all tactics um, and pretense <clears throat> and fakes and phonies. And, um, you know, you, you're never going to get good conviction politicians um, amongst people like that, they're all in the Republican side now, and the Republican side has never been perfect. I mean, they have they have some really revolting people in there. Um, 
Mitt Romney springs to mind, Liz Cheney, of course, um, and others, Raffensperger in Georgia and people like that who have been very corrupted, um, especially by money. But they ha have now had to take a second seat to the MAGA Republicans. MAGA has completely won that party. Yeah, the, the comment of the, um, the Democrats, um, you know, to using out of context, uh, we, they're, they're accusing Trump of trying to be a dictator or be a king. I mean, if you, any sensible person watching that, he's saying to to Christian voters who don't typically vote because, you know, and this is what people don't understand about the United States, is a deeply religious society. Churches is, is right through every levels of society. And so there's a, a large swathe of Christians who who believe in the render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and don't get involved in politics, don't vote because that's part of Caesar's thing, so they don't. What Trump was imploring them to do was, please, just this one time, I need you to vote. And then once I've finished my four years, I'm done. I can only serve two terms. You can go back to doing whatever you want. That's what he's saying. That was what he was saying. It was um, that's where he, you know, speaks off the cuff. But there's nothing wrong with what he said at all. And remember that the Amish never vote on principle. The Amish and the Mennonites do not vote, and um, um, small cultures like that. They just their their whole the reason they love America is they just love being left alone. Um, but in 2016, the Amish came out and voted for the first time for Trump because they knew that they were going to be under religious persecution, and they have been. Hmm. There's that famous um, Amish guy that runs that farm with beautiful food, really pure, pure food, made millions of dollars from it. Um, and he's been hit with lawfare to try and shut down his farm. I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head. But people like that um, are going to vote again, and they will look forward to the day where they don't have to vote again, exactly as Trump was saying. Yeah, well, the Democrats are just looking like mendacious, um, nasty, um, vindictive people, and ultimately that fails at, at the election because people don't like the nasty no, na nastiness and corruption has a very bad odour and it's um, very obvious. I just don't think the people are going to be uh, um, duped. But they weren't duped in 2020 either, remember. Mm. They, you know, they, they will do anything to steal this election. I just don't know what it will be. The only um, thing um, that smells more than the stench of corruption um, that you mentioned is desperation, and desperation is a very... <laughs> Cologne, and that's what I'm seeing from the Democrats. Yeah, it's all it's all of those things, isn't it? And most assuredly, it's desperation. <laughs> on that note, Olivia, thank you so much for sharing your views on the crunch. Uh, you're very welcome. Talk again soon, Cam. Okay. Tell me what you think about Olivia's view. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.